My lord, what's a faceless man's favorite fast food restaurant? I don't know. What is it? It's Jack in the Box, my lord. Do you get it? Do you get it? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Tabletop Never Stop. I'm Toss Sage, and today we're kind of continuing our 2020 trend of uh, catching up on some Ice and Fire boxes. So today we are tackling Neutral Heroes 2. Said a lot of negative things about ne the Neutral faction uh, over the last two years. Um, like that they weren't really a faction, but I think we're well past that point. We got enough units. We got some more heroes. I surrender. Neutrals are a faction. It's happening. Now Brienne and Braun are attachments that if you have the Kickstarter you've been playing with for years. But they're finally available to the masses, um, so we're going to talk about those guys first. Probably won't spend too much time on them. But we have Brienne, the Maid of Tarth. She is a two-cost attachment, and she has Knightly Vow. Before deployment, select one enemy unit until the end of the game. This unit's melee attacks gain plus one to hit, and roll plus two dice against that enemy. And then also Stalwart. This unit gains plus two to morale test rolls. So Brienne's Knightly Vow ability is great. If you know that you're going to be able to use Brienne to engage the unit that she is targeting with her Knightly Vow. Um, but unfortunately, this uh, the selection happens before deployment. And so, um, you know, the smart thing for the enemy to do is to hold that unit back and deploy it as late as possible. Um, of course, you can counter by doing the same thing with Brienne. Um, so there's a little bit of a cat and mouse game you might be playing with your opponent when you use Brienne for Knightly Vow. A couple other tricks would be to put her in a fast unit, so something like the Berserkers for the Starks would be quite good. I mean, they probably don't mean the morale test, you know, they're fast, so they can potentially get to where they're going, and with two more dice, they're, you know, they're, there's not much that's going to stand up to them. The Bastards Girls also have speed and mobility that will allow them to potentially get to their target, although that's an expensive and delicate unit to be putting a two-point attachment in, but, you know, some people love doing stuff like that. Obviously, morale, I'm still kind of filling morale out now, 1.5, I think, but plus two is nothing to laugh at. And I suppose, like, the argument used to be that, oh, you know, stuff like the Berserkers don't care about failing morale tests, but, um, you know, the odds of them failing are still pretty low. But when they fail a panic test now, they're a little more susceptible to damage if they do manage to fail one. So increasing morale to prevent that isn't a bad idea. He has another two-cost attachment. His ability is called Extra Incentive. While you control the money symbol on the tactics board, this unit gains plus one movement, plus two attack rolls, and plus two morale test rolls. Actually, not, not unlike Bran, Bran has a pretty good ability for the cost that you won't get to use all the time. A lot of this new neutral stuff is actually totally revolving around this whole getting a big bonus while you claim the money, money bag symbol. It almost does sound like a fun list where you just stack Braun with Dario and a bunch of Stormcrows and everybody wants the money bag. So on the turns that you get it, your force is really, really powerful. It sounds like a little bit of fun. But, of course, the enemy can totally counter this by claiming the money symbol. And if they have something like Littlefinger, they can claim the money symbol and even when they don't need it. So, and so like for that reason, I've never used Braun. I know there's definitely some people that swear by him. Like, units that already have really good abilities... Um, like, for example, the Great Axes uh, could definitely would love to get those uh, extra dice. In fact, they'd also love to get that extra movement. That's not a bad spot for Bronn, but um, if the enemy's countering you at all, you're not going to get to use his ability all the time. All right, we're on to new stuff. Uh, this is Jack and Hagar, Mysterious Prisoner. He's actually a start card for, as we say, for fluff reasons. Um, real quick, two-cost attachment and may only be fielded in an army that includes Arya Stark, the Wolf Girl. And then before deployment, you attach Jack into an enemy infantry unit, ignoring the usual attachment restrictions. And then so... Alright, so this is a bad card that we're putting onto our opponent. Alright, so here's the power. A name owed. This model is always the last model destroyed from this unit. When this unit is destroyed, your opponent may kill one of your friendly attachments or NCUs. One more time. I... Put, the, put Jack and Hagar in my opponent's unit, and then when he dies, I get to kill another attachment or NCU, which is actually the part that's crazy about this. So this is a pretty powerful ability for two points. We are possibly assassinating 
you know, a three-point attachment or a five-point NCU. Now, there's a fair amount that the opponent can do to prevent this. They know which of their units has Jack in it. They can, you know, put a lot of effort into protecting him. And if we don't kill that unit, we've effectively wasted two points. Although, you know, if we put it in a powerful unit, um, like the commander or whatever, and there's and they hold it back and don't use a powerful ability, then, you know, or just really any unit, if they hold a unit out of uh, the fight, then that's, you know, probably worth it. Getting to kill an NCU is going to feel pretty good, especially if you can kind of do it early. Like, that's going to feel pretty crippling. I mean, honestly, if this, like, if you managed to blow this unit up when I thought you couldn't, and, like, I lost one of my NCUs, like, round two or three before I got to activate it, I'd probably just concede. That's how bummed out I'd be. I don't really love the killing enemy attachments. I actually don't think the NCU thing is that bad, but um, I think this, we're seeing an influx of abilities that kill uh, attachments, and I don't think it hasn't happened, so maybe I'm just out here worrying for nothing, but I think it's a situation that could lead to a really bad meta where people don't run attachments because they're too afraid of having them deleted. And I think we already find that the people generally don't run three cost attachments, or at least fairly rarely, and you know, the reason being, you know, if you're running a three point attachment, for two more points, you could get a whole other unit, a whole other activation. And so that makes it already kind of hard to use those attachments. And, you know, now you're saying my three-point attachments might get killed without me even being able to do anything about it. There are ways to prevent this jack in from triggering. But there's several other ways to delete attachments as well. So it's an ongoing problem. jack in being a Stark card is uh, definitely helping the Stark players out. A uh, fairly mobile force that might be able to get to somewhere you're not expecting them and destroy this uh, attachment that we're, you know, we want that you were wanting to protect. And man, getting to kill an NCU is just crazy. So that's uh, that's Jack and Mysterious Prisoner. And now we're ready for Jack and Hagar Unnamed. This is a two-point attachment. Uh, order, taking a new name. Once per turn, at the start of any turn, replace Jack and with one previously destroyed infantry attachment, friendly or enemy. All right, so when a uh, infantry attachment is destroyed, ironically, potentially could be because Jack and the mysterious prisoner killed them, but uh, if an attachment is destroyed, you can use uh, Jack and Hagar unnamed to become that unit again. There are two things you can do with this. You can, of course, replace a lost infantry attachment of your own. Pretty obvious use of that would be if a powerful attachment gets destroyed, you can just bring it back, um, especially like commanders. Uh, characters like Ned Stark, who whose Texas cards require him to be on the board, uh, would really benefit from having uh, Jack and Hagar in the wings to take up the mantle if necessary. You can also replace enemy attachments. For example, if your opponent's commander was the mountain and you managed to kill him, you could then have a mountain of your own. Um, and of course, this is unprecedented because we have things like Take the Black for the Night's Watch that does effectively the same thing. And so this ability is a little bit of a counter to the complaint I just made about you know, if everyone is running ways to delete attachments, so like, is anyone going to use them? Um, and then having Jack and Hagar to recover that attachment is a bit of a counter to that. Although at the same time, if your opponent has has Jack and Hagar unnamed and they and you're running an expensive attachment and they def defeat it, this is more incentive to not run attachments. So hopefully I don't ever make a I told you so video about how no one runs attachments because I don't it doesn't really feel like any, anything's trending that way but every time I see anything like this I'm always like oh man here we go it's going to be a wasteland of no attachments uh, alright speaking of killing attachments here's Jack Hagar the NCU follower of the Red God f a 5 cost NCU his ability is called choosing a name when Jack Hing claims a zone on the tactics board you may target an enemy infantry unit and roll a die if Jack can claim the sword spot zone, you may re-roll this die. On a 1, there's no effect. On a 2 to 4, you deal 1 wound to that unit. On a, a 5, deal 1 wound or kill 1 non-character attachment in that unit. And 6, kill any 1 model in that unit. Now we're, here we have chance to deal wounds or potentially delete models, either generic or either non-character attachments or on a 6, an actual expensive or commander style uh, attachment, uh, which is pretty terrifying. There's a hard counter to this, and that's to buy the Targaryen box and run an, and run a all cavalry list, because then Jack and Hagar won't do anything to them. Five costs to NCU, 
Uh, he has the potential to do six wounds over the course of a game. Of course, there's always a chance that you roll lots of ones and he's not doing anything. So if I'm not fishing to potentially get rid of attachments, I want to attack high defense targets so that you know my wounds are worth more. Um, but I think it's going to be awfully tempting to go after commanders and or, or just units that have attachments in them. And of course, I tend to put my commanders in units that have high defense, so there you go. You're not going to build with the sword all the time, but that reroll will make jacking much more effective. You know, generally, if you can get if a sword's available, a lot of times you're going to want it. So, and that reroll uh, can definitely help you. You're certainly not rerolling like I wouldn't reroll the four, uh, trying looking for a five or a six because what if you get a one? The other interesting thing about this is you can strategically use it to knock an enemy off of a rank, which if you can do that two or three times over the course of the game, that is uh, going to add up for you. And that can affect how many units you get to bring. So, in fact, there's several other expensive NCUs in this box as well. So, you know, if some opponent brought two five-point NCUs uh, to fight me, even though they're going to be blasting me for uh, you know, a bunch of damage every turn, I do know I'm fighting with several more units than them, so that be interesting to see how willing people are to use these five cost NCUs. Uh, definitely one seems worth it. I don't know about two. I mean, most factions have a three cost NCU, so uh, tagging those, um, combining those together uh, could work out pretty well. Uh, here we have Tycho Nestoris, a four cost non combat unit. He has backing of the Iron Bank. Once per game, at the start of any turn, you may restore up to five wounds total across any number of friendly combat units. And then flip this part over to show that its ability has been used. So I think Tycho is pretty useful in specific lists. Those are lists with high defense units. Um, so I love him with Sworn Shields. I love him with Flayed Men and Bolton Blackguard. Um, I mean, whenever, our, of course, Flayed Men are a little less dangerous now. Uh, now that they're not two ups. Whenever I see Flayed Men, especially if there's like only one of them, I usually put like a lot of energy into trying to get them off the board. I just can't manage the, you know, ignore them strategy. Occasionally, uh, you know, you, you put in what you think is enough energy to kill a unit of Flayed Men and they don't die. And then when they start getting healed back up, it's so frustrating. And that is especially, and so Tycho and Astorus, uh being able to do that to really any high defense target that you've invested heavily in the trying to damage um, can be very disheartening. Uh, you know, four cost is again on the expensive side. And, um, you know, a lot of times it might be better to get a ability you can use six times over the course of the game compared to once. Um, but five wounds can make all the difference. Like, if your commander's are, unit is on its uh, its last rank, uh, this could be quite useful. Even if you're doing all right, handing out five wounds across the army could put several units back up a rank. And that could, um, you know, result in a lot more damage on your turn. So that's, you know, also a thing you can do with Tycho. And rounding out our NCUs is Walter Frey, another 5-cost NCU. His ability is backing the winning side. He has influence. When this unit claims a tactic zone, attach this card to a combat unit until the end of the round. When Walter influences a unit, that unit suffers one wound. If you are a first player, or if you control the crown zone, the influence unit and its attachment lose all abilities. Um, so another expensive unit. This seems... Pretty much worth it in most situations, though. We know that Walter's going to deal six wounds over the course of the game. Um, that's quite useful, again, especially against high defense targets. And uh, But even more so, um, I go, half the time, guaranteed, he's going to have the influence unit and its attachments lose all abilities. Um, that's pretty devastating. This is actually, I didn't even really think about this, but here's another reason not to bring a bunch of attachments, right? Um, if Walter's out there and you can turn off your three-point attachment... You know, that's uh, quite a bummer. <clears throat> Anytime you control the, the crown zone, you also get to remove abilities. So you are guaranteed to have 50% of the time. And then um, anytime you have the crown, you also get it. Uh, that means there's actually some synergy between Walter and Joffrey, although that would be fairly expensive. <clears throat> there's also some fairly zany things we can do when we turn off abilities. Uh, you could, of course, use this to uh, turn off the insignificant ability on free folk units. You could also, for example, turn off Rickon's ability to give extra points when killed if it looked like he was going to die that round. If you wanted to invest 10 points in non-combat units, you could bring Walter Frey and Jacken. And, of course, there's always a chance on Jacken you roll some 1s. 
but that means you could potentially do 12 damage over the course of a game, which is, of course, one, one unit. So that's probably not a great strategy, um, but it is interesting, and you can definitely, as I already kind of said, you can strategically use those uh, free wounds to knock opponents out of their ranks so that their amount of dice that they roll goes down. Used judiciously, uh, I think those these guys are pretty powerful. I don't think, I don't see people running two, two of them, so I don't think you have to worry about some doomsday scenario where you're getting, you know, sniped by magic attacks all the time. Um, but they're uh, definitely both pretty devastating. Okay, so now we're on to Vargo Hoet. This is the attachment version of him, uh, a three-point attachment. He grants Vicious, and he also has Weakened Resolved. When an enemy engaged with this unit fails a panic test, that enemy becomes weakened. Um, so those are two abilities that uh, work well with each other. Pretty good synergy with Cersei as well, uh, or anyone that's handing out panic tokens. I like the I think I like Fargo, Hoot, Crippler, and Fast Unit, so I'm going to hit them, hand out a Weakened Token before they get to counterattack me. And getting Weakened Tokens with like high attack, low defense units is always nice, because it's just a, a way to create some natural defense with those Weakened Tokens. So, an expensive ability, I probably wouldn't take it without a few other additional panic-related abilities. Here is Varro Hoet Commander version, the Goat of Harren Hall. He has affiliation, Bloody Mummers. Any unit he's in counts as a Bloody Mummer unit, which will correlate with his Texas cards, as we'll see in a minute. And then he also has Intimidating, when the unit activates, when an enemy within long range becomes weakened, which we'll also see in a second. Um, synergizes really well with his tactics cards. Handing out tokens at long range is great. That bubble around a unit is act of, of long range is actually really big. In most games, you're going to get to use this a lot. Maybe not opening round, although a lot of times you will get to use it opening round. So if our goal is to survive, decent chance you're going to hand out five to six weakened tokens, which is a uh, you know, pretty strong ability, in my opinion, especially when we see what these how that uh, interacts with these tactics cards. And our first Texas card is Crippler's Infamy. When a weakened enemy combat unit activates, that enemy suffers a panic test. Before they roll, you may expend their weakness token. If you do, the enemy must roll one additional dice and discard the highest result. So uh, here is another ability that would, uh, this would work really well with Cersei. I'm starting to really feel Vargo Ho in a uh, Lannister build for sure. So you can only use this ability on weakened, on weakened enemies, but luckily Vargo Ho is going to be naturally handing those out. So if you were to die, this card would get a lot less useful. As far as expending the weakened token, I would only do that if I thought there was a reasonable chance that the panic test would kill this enemy and they wouldn't get to activate. Um, so an enemy on its last rank, I would consider uh, doing that. Otherwise, I'm assuming the enemy's going to attack on its activation. I would probably rather have the weakened token to prevent the damage. Although, I guess there's an argument that, you know, taking the damage might drop it a rank. Anyway, next we have Mummer's Trick. At the start of any turn, target an engaged combat unit. The enemy must pass a morale test or become vulnerable and weakened. If you are engaged with the Bloody Mummer unit, they suffer minus two to their roll. Um, so this is a bit of a uh, versatile uh, neutral card, which we see a lot. Like neutral tactics cards tend to be useful both on attack and defense. And so here, you know, we're giving enemy, we're giving a chance to put vulnerable and weakened tokens on an opponent. Meaning, if we're trying to kill a unit, we can, um, or at least really damage it. We can get where they're getting vulnerable. But if we're out to get attacked, we're also making them weakened, and then of course they'll be vulnerable when we get to go again. And um, if there's a bloody armor involved, then uh, they're gonna a minus two on this morale test that's going to affect whether or not they get this token. And again, it's a natural synergy with with Cersei here, and just really any other panic-inducing uh, abilities. And finally, remorseless assault. When a friendly unit attacks before attack dice are rolled. You can spend a weakened token from the defender, and then this attack rolls plus two dice and gains sundering. If the attacker is a buddy mummer, the unit also rolls its highest attack value, regardless of remaining ranks, a uh, ability that corresponds with our weakened tokens. Vargo Hoet activates, puts a weakened token on an enemy, but the enemy is pretty close to death, so instead of um, leaving the weakened token on and you know using it against a a one rank attack, we can remove the weakened token and decent chance of killing the unit off so we don't have to worry about it anymore. And the trigger for Bloody Mummers getting to roll their highest attack value is quite great for late game. I actually really like abilities that let us to allow us to attack as if we have full ranks because <clears throat> a lot of times late game uh, infantry you can be down to only a couple of dice and being able to all of a sudden go back up to full dice is really great. 
All right, and here is Dario Naharis, the Reckless Mercenary. Order, Reckless Strikes. When this unit makes a melee attack before attack dice are rolled, this attack rolls plus two dice and hits from rolls of six, not allowed defense saves. And this unit suffers one wound for each miss. So this is an ability we might expect to see in the Starks. At the right time, this is uh, could still be useful anywhere. Obviously kind of designed for high defense targets since we can get a chance to pierce enemy um, defense but by rolling sixes. I would definitely recommend using this on a charge or some other way that you get re-rolls. Uh, otherwise, you know, it could end up being fairly bad for you. And definitely use this order if you have a weakened token. Oh, and this is a uh, two-cost attachment. Now we have Dario Naharis, Stormcrow Captain. This is the commander version of him. The affiliation Stormcrows. This unit counts as a Stormcrow unit. And then loyalty through a coin. While you control the money bags on the tactics board, this unit gains plus one to defense save rolls and never suffers penalties to morale and cannot have ex panic tokens expended from it. Getting an additional Stormcrow unit will be useful for Dario's tactics cards. Loyalty through coin, decent defensive ability, but as we've already kind of discussed, this money bags thing is fairly counterable, so I wouldn't want to rely on it too much. Let's look at his tactics cards. All right, we have Forced March. At the start of the round, one friendly infantry unit may pivot and then make one free march action and then become weakened. Free march action, uh, pretty good for claiming objectives. Um, I can definitely see a scenario where the Bolton Blackguards are marched out front and grab an objective, and then the assumption is that we're going to be able to hold uh, with them. And, you know, a high defense unit, if we're holding an objective, one weakened token is not that big of a deal. Using this to get, like, a flank is a little bit less interesting because, like, sure, we got the flank, but the enemy has that reroll. Um, and weakened tokens on, like, a charge are always irritating because, you you know, you get it, you, you go in, get your reroll, you have a bunch of dice, a bunch of successful hits, and then the enemy makes you reroll them all. So I can see that you're claiming this for objectives, but, uh, you know, grab it. No one really wants... Who wants a weakened token, right? Uh, next, we have Mercenary's Cunning. When an enemy would place a condition token on a friendly combat unit, instead, that unit suffers one wound, and you may place that token on an enemy combat unit within a short range of the targeted unit. If this was a Stormcrow unit, you may place any condition token instead. So this is a little bit situational. Some armies are never going to bother putting enemy condition tokens on you, um, either because they don't have the ability to do that, or they're just not taking the tactic spot, which also is another way to get condition tokens, obviously. I would say, I mean, everyone's tactics tech is good, but like, in my opinion, the like the new factions, Baratheons and Targaryens, like they're a little bit lack, like their units are slightly less good, in my opinion, and in like response to that, they get better tactics cards. And so I think there's an inclination there for them to be claiming the tactic spot a lot, which means they'll be getting condition tokens, meaning that you could then play Mercenaries Cunning on them. I think if you play in the same people a lot and they see you running Dario, they're going to like quickly be like, oh boy, here we come. Here comes Mercenaries Cunning. So it almost feels like a gotcha card, and there are some ways around it. If I put a condition token on an enemy that has no in, no one within short range of them, this card doesn't do anything. Uh, it definitely feels good to it'll definitely feel good to play this card on people, but yeah. And finally, if Reckless Strikes, this is basically the same thing that the attachment version of Dario has. When a friendly combat unit makes a melee attack before attack dice are rolled, this attack rolls plus two dice and hits from rolls of six, not allow defensive saves. This unit suffers one wound for each miss. And if we're doing this to a Stormcrow unit, we get a roll with our highest attack die value. Definitely don't use this tactics card if on a, on a unit that has weakness, that has a weakened token, because you'll have a bad time. All right, and that concludes uh, today's video. The neutral boxes are a lot more easy to recommend than the other boxes, because, of course, every faction, besides those poor wildlings, uh, could definitely benefit from um, some of these guys. And uh, there's, I mean, the game is shifting. It's uh, definitely moving in, into a different direction. Uh, all this, like, unblockable wounds from a distance and uh, elimination of enemy attachments. Um, you know, I don't love it, but it also doesn't necessarily feel, I'll have to wait and see, but it doesn't necessarily feel like it's going to be everywhere. So probably no reason to panic. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you did... Please give it a like, and otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.